Hey everyone, my name's Dom, welcome to the channel. Today I've got my June wrap up for you and I'm also going to take a look at some of the titles I'm aiming to read in July and a closer look at some of the buddy reads and channel read-alongs that I'm planning just over the horizon as well. So if you haven't already done so and if you want to of course give a like and subscribe buttons a little nudge and then let's dive in and see how we got on in June. So June 2021, this was the month of the Shelf Space Olympics Readathon. This was my first foray into readathons or any other kind of group or buddy led reading experience. And I jumped in, I had a blast. I really enjoyed my time with Team Dionysus and with the wider Shelf Space community. I set myself what for me was a challenge, which was seven books um, or seven titles, I guess, really, because it was uh, five novels, a novella and Number seven was an audio book, uh, which I was going to try and consume in the month as well. Seven is quite a big number for me. My Previously, my record had actually been six for the month, so um, I knew I could do it, and uh, at the same time, it would be quite challenging. And the readathon also gave me the opportunity to uh, hit a couple of titles that I've been putting off for no real reason, just haven't got round to them. Uh, as well as finishing off a series that I was really enjoying but probably wouldn't have got round to finishing for another few months otherwise. So all in all, it was a really good reading month for me. I did complete all of the titles that I wanted to read, um, as well as picking up another couple of audio books in the month as well. So total number was nine, that novella, five novels and three audio books as well. So just running through them in chronological order as I uh, as I read or listened to them. Um, in May, I started out with Assassin's Apprentice by Robin Hobb and got about halfway through. So I finished this book as my first book at the start of June. Um, this was a really good title. I gave it three and a half stars. I enjoyed it, but especially the kind of the last third or so of the book where for me it really started to pick up and gather a bit of pace. Um, really looking forward to reading the second and the third book in the series and continuing my journey through the realm of the Elderlings. I'm not going to give uh, a full kind of bit of detail about Assassin's Apprentice because what I'll do in the top corner is just link the dedicated review that I did for the book in a previous video. But uh, a solid start for the month, three and a half stars for me is a really good rating so uh, it was uh, a great place to kick off the month with. So book number two for the month for me was my team pick, which was The Shadow of What Was Lost by James Islington. This was one that I've been looking forward to. I've had the Lacanius trilogy in my sights for a little while, but uh, this was uh, this reader form was a perfect opportunity for me to pick it up and actually give it a go. So book one in the series, I really enjoyed actually. Um, I've picked up ebooks of books two and three, and I'm uh, looking forward to reading them as well. Um, but uh, book one, The Shadow of What Was Lost, we start off in a kind of a magic school setting, although we don't spend a vast amount of time in there and we're, uh, our main characters are um, relatively early on in the book, they're setting off out into the wider world and exploring this new land that the book gives us. So I thought this was a really interesting world, it's one which has um, a couple of defined types of magic which are linked but at the same time different um, and uh, I think that was ex both explained quite well and actually utilised quite well within the story. We've got some other kind of magical or mystical aspects, uh, things like shadows and the blind which I won't go into detail in this little video but um, they, they give a nice little bit of intrigue to the story, they move it along, they give it some, uh, some decent kind of stakes as um, our characters are moving around the world. Books two and three I'm hoping for um, kind of more of the same because uh, I thought the action was quite good, the setting, the characters I liked, the world, all of it I thought was uh, was a really good solid entry into a series so um, hopefully you know if the if the second and the third books can continue as the first one started this could be a new favourite series for me and I'm hoping that's the way that it's going to turn out. So 
a solid four stars for this one. So starting the month with a three and a half and a four is a really great reading month already for me. Next up for me for June was my novella for the month, which was The Emperor's Soul by Brandon Sanderson. This is one that's been sitting on my Kindle for I don't know how many years. Um, I picked it up wanting to read it and just never got around to it. So again, the readathon gave me the perfect excuse to actually get this one read and tick it off the list. The concept for The Emperor's Soul I thought was actually pretty good. It's all about a uh, kind of a master forger who is who is tasked basically to forge a soul for a dying emperor. Sounds kind of weird in itself, but it, early on in the novella, it does explain that this is a world that is kind of heavily reliant, or not necessarily reliant, but heavily features forgeries of various things. We're talking uh, tables where you can um, kind of trick the memory of the table into thinking it's a more ornate table, for instance. And there's loads of examples of that early on in the book um, of various things that have been forged in this way. So. Forging a soul is not something that is generally done, so it's a really massive task for our main character. And the the book itself was good. The novella read well. It's I mean, it's Brandon Sanderson. We kind of know what to expect from him, I guess. But I just thought for a novella, there just wasn't the room to really execute this well. The I mean, a novella, you always, for me at least, you always have that kind of battle between creating a good world and some good characters but also having a good story and it's really difficult in the short space that you get in a novella format to really do all three of those items really well. For me I thought it was just a bit lacking in the character and the world department. You just didn't see enough of them. The, the forgeries that I said were quite detailed in their explanation at the start, but it was it was kind of really concise. There was a real focus on that element of the world and actually not much more. Most of the story itself, almost all of it in fact, is set within a few rooms in a, uh, a kind of a palace. And so you don't really see the world, you just hear through things like these forgeries and other little stories um, about what's happened or how the world works but you don't get to see any of it you don't get to see too much character development but at the same time you kind of expect that going in because it's a novella so overall for me it was it was a three it was okay but it wasn't brilliant um i think if it was a kind of expanded to a novel form then it could have been a really really good book and a really interesting one because i say the main kind of selling point for The Emperor's Soul for me was the actual concept of the story itself. I just felt that it didn't have the space, it didn't get the legs um, to, uh, to really show its worth in a no uh, novella format. And then as far as books go, I rounded the month out with the second, third and fourth books in the Great Coach series by Sebastian de Castell. I read the three books back to back, starting with Night Shadow, um, which, if you've read Traitor's Blade, Night Shadow is kind of more of the same. The storyline itself really follows on. It's almost like the two books are kind of one which has just been split. There's, um, there is a difference in the story, but it's very much continuing driving the story from Traitor's Blade forward. The characters in it are great. I really love the, the interactions between our main three or four characters here in the Great Coats themselves. The world is absolutely fine. We get to see more of it in Night Shadow than we did in Traitor's Blade. So it's, I mean, it's a series. So as you go on through the series, obviously you get more opportunity to expand on the world, to visit new places and so forth. And that's exactly what we got here. Night Shadow for me was a four and a half star read. I really enjoyed it. It was a great continuation of the series. Um, and this is one which has quickly started to move itself up my list of favourites. Book three in the series then was Saint's Blood. This was a bit of a departure from the story. We've still got the main overarching story of Traitor's Blade and Night Shadow in there. 
Um, but we we start to develop new aspects, uh, new storylines coming in as well. So in Saints Blood, we've got uh, saints, they're being killed off. Obviously, I won't go into the reasons for this for spoiler purposes, but it gives a really interesting aspect to the story. We've got a bit of mystery, uh, not necessarily a who done it, but we're kind of going along trying to stop this from happening before basically all of the saints are killed. And of course, there's a reason that someone is killing the saints, so we want to be stopping this kind of end game from happening. Saints Blood for me was the best book in the Great Coach series. It was a flat five star read for me. I thoroughly enjoyed it. The end of the book especially, it was kind of ramping up from practically the midway point right until the end. It just kept hitting you and hitting you and going faster. And it was absolutely brilliant for me. I really, really loved this one. Book four then, finishing off the Great Coach series is Tyrant's Throne. This one was, I hesitate to use the word disappointment, it wasn't really a disappointment for me, it's just it wasn't as good as Saint's Blood, but as I've said, it's my favourite of the series, so you know, moving on to the next book, you're obviously going to be coming down from that position. So Tyrant's Throne for me was a four-star read. It was a great book in its own right, it's on its own merits, it had a good storyline, again it had a, uh, another departure from the overarching Greatcoats theme, but we moved on and again experienced new people and new worlds, we got to uh, to travel to a, one of the neighbouring countries in this one as well, and all of the aspects that that brought in and uh, elements of war and so forth. This is my least favourite in the series, and I've rated it at four stars, so that was really, really high praise. The series itself is absolutely now one of my favourites. It's obviously fresh in my memory, so uh, we've got that kind of proximity there, but uh, I still think that uh, in, in months to come, when it's uh, when it started to uh, to fade in my memory a bit, I'm still going to consider The Great Coast as one of the best series that I've read, certainly one of my favourite series that I've read. Now, alongside the reading that I was doing, I set myself um, kind of a, a separate challenge almost um, with regards to audiobooks because I'm not a big audiobooks person and I wanted to give audiobooks another chance, but also um, give the Malazan Book of the Fallen another chance as well. I previously got uh, partway through book three, Memories of Ice, and uh, wasn't able to continue many, many years ago, so I thought, two birds with one stone, let's try an audio book and see if I can do that one. So um, the answer in short was no. So yeah, I didn't really enjoy Memories of Ice. Um, it's difficult actually for me to tell whether it was because of the book, the story itself, or because of listening to it on audio book format where I know that I'm still trying to decide whether audio books are for me. What I did decide is that uh, an audiobook of a Malazan story is, is just not the way to go. It's, uh, for me at least, it was just too complex to really be able to follow it coherently. I did listen to the whole thing, all 43, I think it was, hours of the story, but there were times when it was just really dragging and it was really difficult to keep on top of who was who and where they were and what they were doing. So obviously that's going to contribute to a, a bit of a negative experience anyway. Overall, I, I went with a two and a half star rating for this book because it just, it just didn't do it for me. Whether it was because it was audio or not, I don't know. But uh, I've, you know, this is the second time that I've tried it, uh, two different formats, and I've just, I've just not gone on with it. So uh, I'm happy with that. I'm going to, I'm just going to give um, Move Malazan aside and say it's not for me. I wanted to try it again and see what everyone's going on about. But, you know, sometimes you find that books and series and authors just aren't for you and there is absolutely nothing wrong with that. And in fact, I've, I've literally today packaged up my copy, my paperback of Memories of Ice, and I'm going to ship it off to America tomorrow for another lovely booktuber who's going to give it a nice loving home. So because Malazan and Memories of Ice didn't go down well for me, 
but I wasn't sure if it was because of a story or because of audio books. I thought I've still got some of the months to go. Let's get in another couple of audio books and find out. So taking someone's advice, can't remember who, but someone I saw on Discord um, recommended a reread. So from memories of ice, I went to Reaper Man by Terry Pratchett. Obviously one of the Discworld stories. Um, I love Discworld. I haven't read them in a long, long time because I think my my tastes have kind of moved on a bit from there, but I do still love the stories and have a, a soft spot in my heart for them. Reaper Man was absolutely fine. It was uh, three and a half stars. The audio performance itself was actually really, really good. Uh, I forget who the narrator was so I want to say Stephen Lister and if I'm wrong I'm going to just put it across the bottom here but um, it was really good some really good voices and accents and so forth in there um, the story itself is if you're used to Discworld it's kind of a typical Discworld fare um, this is one of the death novels um, the second in the death um, kind of series sub-series I think um, and we're we're kind of dealing with essentially the theme of uh, death having a, a vacation, a holiday. It's, it's not quite what happens, but that's kind of how it uh, how it uh, looks and how it works out. And then finally, I did a third audio book, and uh, for this one, just to uh, just because it was a short uh, novella in itself, I listened to "This Is How You Lose the Time War." by Max Gladstone and Amal al Mota, and this was a complete departure for me from my normal style. This was a bit more kind of sci-fi. Um, we're following two, two operatives who each work for opposing kind of agencies, if you like. Uh, they're kind of um, a bit like the Time Bureau that you see in some sci-fi um, properties, where they go back and forth in time and kind of change things that mostly in this one that the other person has done so um they're called blue and red so blue will go and, uh, and do one thing and then red will be sent back to kind of reverse what was done and so forth because uh, i guess the two agencies the two opposing forces have both got different timelines that they want as the correct timeline now, other than the actual storyline, the, um, the novella itself is kind of a bit different because it is told largely through letters that Blue and Red leave for each other. So at the start, it's, it's just very matter of fact and uh, it's just, you know, I, I noticed you there, you know, you weren't hidden from me. Um, and they kind of start taunting each other and, uh, and things like that. And then they start to grow a relationship through time. Um, through the format of these letters and as they're starting to get to know each other and, and kind of almost giving like recommendations of uh, timelines and places to go and sample things, uh, foods and, and things like that. They're asking questions and they're essentially kind of becoming friends through this, uh, this process of leaving letters back and forth to each other. So you don't get to see a vast amount of the world because it's mostly um, told through these letters, but uh, you do kind of see and hear what's happening around each of these instances as uh, the two characters uh, visit different times and different places and kind of explain what's going on there. So it's, it was quite interesting. It was um, the story itself I actually quite enjoyed as something very, very different to what I would normally read. So um, I would say if I didn't pick up the audio book of this, I wouldn't have picked up the actual physical book and read it. So uh, I wouldn't have uh, found out the story. And, uh, you know, for something different, I quite enjoyed it. This was another three and a half star rating for me. So uh, again, it was it was enjoyable. It was not a stellar read, but a bit like The Emperor's Soul. It was just a novella. So you, you've kind of lost the extra space to really develop your characters and your world and your scenarios. Um, but uh, for what it had, I thought it did a pretty good job. So with June out of the way, we come to what we're going to do for July. And I've got a couple of um, advanced review copies from NetGalley that are both released in August. So I'm going to kick off the month with those and get them out of the way and get reviews done for them 
in a nice timely fashion. So the first of these that I started reading a couple of days ago is Nolin by Michael J. Sullivan. This is the first book in the new Rise and Fall series. It's released on the 3rd of August. So this is set in the same world as the Legends of the First Empire and the Rhaeyra uh, Revelations, Rhaeyra Chronicles stories with uh, two of my favourite characters, actually Royce and Hadrian. We're talking... Um, the series itself, Rise and Fall, is set around about a thousand years before the Rai era um, kind of era. So um, it's kind of bridging the gap between the legends of the First Empire and the Rai era kind of timeline. Nolin is focusing on a character called Nolin, who is the heir to the Empire. And he's been exiled for, I think it's 500 years um, and he's suddenly kind of thrust into a goblin war and is sent off to rescue an outpost, but it's actually kind of an ambush and uh, there's no actual uh, outpost there. He's essentially been sent there to die. So I won't go into too much detail for Nolin, partly because that's basically everything that's, uh, that's really said in the synopsis for the book, and I've not read far enough into it myself to, uh, to know too much more beyond that. But um, I really enjoyed the Rhaeyra Revelations. It's one of my favourite series. Um, largely, as I've said, because it's got two great characters in Royce and Hadrian, but I did enjoy the writing style. So that's the main reason that I've picked up Nolin to see if it continues in that kind of vein. And uh, I'll see, uh, see if this is going to be another series that I quite like from the same author. And then the second... ARC that I've picked up for this month is released a week later, so it's the 10th of August, and that is The Maleficent 7 by Cameron Johnson. This, um, I'm going to admit, this was uh, put on my radar really when I saw the cover of the book, which I just think is a really cool cover. And um, I saw it on NetGalley a couple of months later, actually, and, uh, and immediately requested it and uh, was able to pick up a copy to review. This is, um, as the title suggests, a retelling of the Magnificent Seven, which is in itself a retelling of Seven Samurai, the Akira Kurosawa classic. So we're dealing with a bunch of um, kind of warriors who are um, gathered together for a last stand to defend a town, um, which sounds kind of the same as what we're going to have in this story here. So. Um, that's the main setting of both Seven Samurai and The Magnificent Seven. So in this one, we're dealing with a character called Black Heron, who is um, kind of a, a warlord. She's um, a general who had six captains of different types. We've got like an orcish um, leader, a, a necromancer, a vampire, and, you know, this uh, really odd bunch but uh, they basically had the entire continent on their knees cowering before them and then 40 years later there's this new threat that's on the horizon and Black Heron and her six captains are gathered together again basically to have this last stand and uh, stand up to this new threat. So yeah overall this one sounds like quite an interesting story. The kind of seven samurai story itself I think is is quite a good one anyway it's quite a classic it's stood the test of time and it's been reproduced in various other uh, well formats uh, but various other stories as well so we know it's a working one it's just a case of whether you the author can make it work for his particular setting and his particular characters so I'm really interested to see how this one goes and uh, hopefully it's going to be another one that turns out to be a winner then the third book and uh, and the final book actually that I've set myself in advance for July is Sword of Kaigen by M. L. Wong. This is um, a buddy read actually over on the Wizardly Duo Discord. Um, there's a good bunch of us who are going to be reading it in July, so um, I'm really looking forward to joining in the conversation with them. It's actually going to be my first buddy read, so uh, again I'm really looking forward for that aspect of it. Uh, as much as I am from the, the actual story itself. This one's a bit of a booktube darling and I'm not going to go into the details because first of all I'm really going into it blind. I've read the blurb a little while ago and kindly forgotten it so 
um, are going to experience this one really from a fresh standpoint but um, a lot of people have said that it is absolutely amazing um, and also that you're uh, it's a book that's really going to sort of emotionally affect you. So um, I've been told essentially that if I don't end up crying, then there is something wrong with my humanity. So uh, we'll see how that one goes. But I'm really looking forward to it and uh, and seeing what everyone else thinks of it as well. Now, talking of buddy reads and read alongs, there's a number of them coming up. As I've said, I've not actually taken part in any myself, but uh, with Sword of Kaigan being the first one. I've then got, I think, 11 coming up between now and December that I'm hoping or certainly aiming at the moment to be taking part of. So there's various booktubers who have buddy reads or channel read-alongs and there's, uh, there's loads of official and unofficial ones that you can find in the Shelf Space server and in all the various other discords uh, as well for the community. I've put together a... Um, kind of a little spreadsheet just with a few of these buddy reads and read-alongs listed so i'll link in the description down below and if you're looking for one or if you just want to browse for it and see if there's a particular book that you're interested in that someone has a read-along for or a buddy read then uh, it's got the discord link so you can go on and join along and uh, and join in the fun of it basically so a few of the, uh, the titles that I'm going to be joining in with uh, with others as we read them in the coming months. So I've got Best Served Cold by Joe Abercrombie, uh, which I'm going to be reading with a couple of the others um, on Megan's Reading Revelations Discord. I've then got the Priory of the Orange Tree over on the Wizardly Duo Discord. I'm going to be reading Tad Williams' um, Memory, Sorrow and Fawn over the course of a few months with the guys over there as well. And then start in August, which I think is the same time scale as Memory, Sorrow and Fawn, over on the Library of Alexandria, we are going to be doing the Shadows of the Act, the first four books in four consecutive months from August. So I really enjoyed the series. It's one of my favourites. And when I was just looking over the series for doing a recent video that I did, which again, I'll link up above, um, I, I really got excited for it again. And uh, so I'm going to pick up Empire in Black and Gold and read along and not miss out uh, when the guys over on Alan's channel are reading it. So there's plenty of uh, community reads that I'm looking forward to over the next few months to the end of the year. And uh, if you've got any other read alongs, buddy reads that you want to include in this list so that everyone can see them, let me know and I'll, uh, I'll update them and obviously give me a link for where people can go to find the information and actually join in the fun and the chat. So anyway, that was my June, a really good month for me, both in terms of volume and quality of the books that I read, and I'm hoping for more of the same in July and the coming months as well. Let me know down in the comments if you've read any of these titles and uh, if you've got anything to say, if you agree or disagree with my opinions on them, and also if you've got any uh, read-alongs or buddy reads that you want me to include on the tracker as well, and uh, we can look forward to those together. In the meantime though, have yourselves a good month and uh, read some good books and I'll see you in the next video.